Okay, welcome back everybody. Welcome to the people who have come in and are new. And in case you missed, Bart just presented the introduction to the move package. And now Bart's going to expand quite a bit more in another chapter of his dissertation about uh, the dynamic burning bridge utilization distribution. Thank, thank you, Scott. Uh, well, as in the previous presentation, for those who would want to work along, it's well possible. It's uh, the R file is downloadable in this URL. Um, I'll be presenting the work on the dynamic Brownian bridges, which is an extension, I guess you could call it, of the work done by Horn et al. Um, so I think most people should be able to get it if they have gotten it if they want. Um, and basically, the, it's an extension that we developed together with Kami, Scott, Martin, and Roland, which I don't think are in the room, um, where we looked at Brownian bridges. And there, I think Brownian bridges to calculate utilization densities are quite attractive. Because if you have these three locations, we know there is a certain order between the locations. For example, it went from the um, lower left locations up to the middle location and then to the right. And that means that probably the space in between these locations has been used more than the other space. And I think this is the concept that the Brownian bridges include into the calculation of utilization densities. But then the problem is, in order to calculate this, um, we need to know how much more or how restricted it is to the, short line, the shortest connection between the two locations. Because this is one assumption. This, uh, how wide it is. And it, but it could also be that the animal maybe wandered around a bit more between the locations, or even more. And um, uh, in this case, I drew the 95 and 50% utilization uh, density contours. And in order to uh, calculate how uh, much it wandered around between the locations, or how much we think it deviated from the straight line connection, we use the Brownian motion uh, variance. That's the parameter that defines this. And this parameter can be calculated or was suggested to be calculated as taking a trajectory, um, leaving out every uh, second location, then calculate where you would expect the location to be. Would you not uh, have known it? And then you calculate the distance to the observed location, and you can use this using uh, a likelihood function to calculate utilization density. Um, but then we are thinking about this, and this was in the context of migration, but basically in the context of any be behavior, the variance is most likely not going to be a static thing. This changes all the time. The animals change its behavior, and when it changes its behavior, um, probably how much it wanders off from the straight line connections changes. The skill the animal moves on changes. So assuming that there's one parameter that works throughout the whole trajectory is somewhat unrealistic. And therefore, we uh, worked on this extension, which we called the dynamic Brownian bridges, which estimates the variance along the trajectory. Um, so all the details and the validations are described in the paper we wrote about it, but I'll shortly introduce you to the idea. So what we have, if we have a trajectory here, the gray dots are the observations, and it changes the behavior at the red location. So we could first estimate the variance for this whole section, which we call a window, and then estimate what the variance is. And because it's defined by a likelihood function, we can also estimate, or we can also estimate the variance for a division of the window. So we can divide it at the second location, estimate the variance for the first part and for the second part. And we can do this for any combination of divisions. And uh, then we could use the uh, Bayesian information criterion. Um, and this procedure is somewhat uh, derived from the procedure Gurari used in his paper on segmentation. We can use the Bayesian information criterion. And this indicates how well the trajectory is described by the various either by dividing it or by using one variance for the whole section, the window we're interested in. And um, 
we will then find which is the, uh, has the uh, lowest BIC value, so the Bayesian information criterion, which describes how well the fit is. And uh, we can then use those associated variances to uh, assign to the trajectory. We can only assign them to the middle part of the trajectory because uh, at the end we can't allow for a change because the, in some states you want to have a few locations to base your estimation of the variance on and how many locations at the side of the window we use for this we call the margin. So by doing this we showed um, that this actually helps to improve the utilization density. It gives a better description of where the animal is. We did this by leaving locations of the animal out. And we can also see that the variance corresponds to behavior. So uh, in this case, for example, this is uh, a fissure. And you see that the variance during the day is a lot lower than the variance during the night where it is moving around and active. So I think we, what I want to do, or show you, and maybe you work along if you want, is using the move package, we'll um, calculate the Brownian bridges and visualize them and uh, discuss them a bit. So basically, you can load the move package, and then load the data file. And that's here in the first package, you load the move package. With session info, you can check which libraries you have loaded, and if you have the newest version, the move package should be somewhere up here, the four point, uh, the one point two point uh, four hundred and seventy-five is the newest version of the move package, and then we can load the data. In this case, we're using Leroy. That's a Fisher data set that's in the uh, associated with the move package. And first of all. In order to do these calculations, we need a Cartesian projection. So then we uh, can do SP transform with center is true. Um, and then we'll first st start calculating the variance. So the variance can be calculated using the Brownian motion variance DIN, DIN for dynamic function. And uh, you need three parameters you need uh, or four arguments so first of all you need the movement data set which in this case is the data AEQD then you need to say how wide the window needs to be you need to say uh, how wide your margins are going to be and you need to give a location error you need to give a location error per uh, observation so in this case I'll repeat the 23 which is the standard deviation of the location error uh, repeated the number of locations of the animal. So, and then it will start. Yeah. Um, the units are the standard deviation of the uh, of a normal distribution. The errors assumed to be normally distributed. The units are your map units, true. <laughs> yeah? Um, the, sorry, yeah, how we should decide about what window size and margin are good ones. Um, first of all, it depends a bit on what behavioral changes you actually want to describe. If you only want to describe long-term behavioral changes, so it's a combination of the unit size in, or the window size and margin are measured in uh, the number of locations. So if you have a very frequent track, this will, uh, the same window size and margin will give a different uh, result than a very sparse track. And then you need to think about what frequency of behavioral changes you would want to describe. If you want to describe very frequent behavioral changes, you maybe want to have a smaller window size and margin than if you want to describe very uh, long-term behavioral changes. Uh, longer windows have the power to describe, to pick up more distinct changes besides the rendering window. So if you have certain changes, because this window is applied in a rendering window fashion, so every time it's recalculated for the next part of the trajectory. But if you have a longer window size and margins, you will be able to describe more uh, 
subtle changes in the variance behavior. Um, so I would really suggest that you try the various options, play around a bit. Um, I think for me, something like 31, 15, or uh, 13, or 11 for the margin generally works quite good. We did some cross-validations, and that could be a good way to make a more objective decision about it. So there's not one solid recommendation. You could say, at least think about how often you think the behavior changes. If you have behavior that, say you have um, a location every half an hour, and you uh, uh, want to describe the changes from day to night, you maybe do, won't want to go with a window much larger than, uh, what is it, 25, 28 locations, because otherwise you'll start going over, like you first have a section of day or night in your window, then a section of day, and then a section of night, and it can't describe these two changes. I mean, that's the recommendations I can give. So once we calculated the variance, we can also store it here in data var, and then this can be retrieved again. Now we get the variance. Uh, sometimes it's very low, that's probably when it was not moving at all, and sometimes it's larger. And if we then, uh, we can, for example, also um, express it um, against the uh, um, time. So we could now, here, if you take the timestamps from the variance object and then get the variance itself, and in this case we use the type is S because we have, want to have a step graph, and now you see how the variance changes over the tracking period. So here you see it ranges from February to March, and you see that sometimes it has a very low variance. It's probably when it's resting or very inactive in those periods where it has a higher variance. Oh, yeah? Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, but that's only calculating the variance. But with this variance, you can then use it to calculate the Brownian bridges. And you can both calculate it if you calculate the variance before, or if you didn't calculate the variance, it will just calculate it uh, on the fly uh, for you. So if we run this code, um, So here we, again, can calculate the, so now the variance is calculated again. And then um, the utilization density is calculated. As you see, if you calculate the utilization density, it will report the computational size. And so this is now, it's an indication of how long the calculations will take. Um, it's mostly useful to see if it will ever finish or if it's, you maybe have this combination of parameters that are not very likely to finish. Um, in order to calculate the utilization density, we need to define a grid over which we want to calculate it. And in this case, I specified the argument raster is 100. And that says that my grid cells are going to be 100 by 100 meters. There's alternative options where you can say, I want the grid to be maximally uh, if you use the dim size, you say the grid can maximally be, be that number of locations wide or high. And um, you could also say at least extend it a bit, because of course you always have the trajectory, but there's some probability just outside the trajectory. Therefore, you can, you can use the ext extension command. Yeah? Uh, can you uh, set your raster to be one study area raster? Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, you could just specify, or actually you can provide a raster. And this can even be the raster for which you uh, have the environmental data. So you can directly calculate it on the same resolution. So you can directly compare or multiply the various uh, attributes. If you, for example, want to calculate the average temperature the animal would be providing, if you have a raster of temperature, you could multiply the two rasters later on. Um, so once you calculate the UD, you can plot it. In this case, we'll use plot Leroy UD. That's a bit of a low resolution. Wait, just the zoom. So, in this case, you see that also because the resolution of the raster is not so high to make it finish within the time we have, that there's a few locations that use this rather intensely and more not so intense. If you want to emphasize the color changes, you could either provide a color scale. The easiest for just quick exploration, I just find to put the square root of the of the utilization density, and this is just a very quick hack that highlights the changes a bit more. Um, but you could also calculate the contours and just add them directly to the grid. So if you use the contour function, you can say the contour directly also plots it. So if you say add is true, it will add it to the current plot. You say which levels you want. In this case, I take the 50% utilization uh, contour and then 95% utilization contour. We can also do raster to contour of the utilization density and then it will just return a spatial lines object with all the contours in it. directly from the utilization. QGIS, Kami suggests. <laughs> um, and as Tony asked, what to do with multiple animals? If you have a move stack, in this case, I have one with two animals, I take a rather short stack, then uh, you can also calculate the utilization density at once for all animals, and it will calculate them on the same raster. So in this case, you see that I specify my raster myself. I say I want a raster encompasses the stack with a resolution of 250 meters. I want to enlarge this raster a bit, uh, so I have some area around the animals. And if I then do um, um, basically use the Brown and Bridge function again, but provide the stack, and then say I want to calculate over this raster, and then with the location error and the margin, Um, you can calculate the Brownian bridge at once for both uh, animals. So this takes a bit of time. And then from that, you get a Brownian bridge uh, stack, which is again an extension of a raster stack. So you can do any calculation you can do on a raster, you can do with this. And we could, for example, plot it. And then you see that you get two layers. You have the 
utilization of uh, Ricky T and the utilization of Leroy. In this case, they're not overlapping, but you could, for example, also investigate overlap between animals and all kinds of variables. You could also, um, if you, um, um, for example, have a segmented trajectory, Um, that has, uh, for example, day and night. Uh, in this case, I calculate the solar position and then um, segment my trajectory. Uh, oh. So in this case, I load the map tools package use the solar pos, which calculates the position of the sun. Uh, I want the second column, which is the angle of the sun. If it's below or above the horizon, it's positive. If it's below the horizon, it's negative. If it's above the horizon, it's positive. And then I can say, I want to burst my trajectory. So say certain parts of the trajectory are day, other parts of the trajectory are night. Um, here I make just a simple comparison. If it's lower than zero, the sun is below the horizon. If it's above zero, it's above the horizon. Then I get a burst of trajectory, as we saw in the last uh, tutorial. And we can also calculate the utilization density for this. So what it, in this case, will do is we'll estimate the variance for the whole trajectory at once. It won't calculate the variance per burst. It will estimate the same variance with the dynamic Brownian bridge. But then we'll calculate the utilization density per part of this uh, trajectory, if it would be migration or if it would be whatever you decided to segment it by. And then you get these um, util uh, you get a utilization density per layer. And you could um, use this to, um, for example, also classify it by day or night and you could sum them per day and night. So in this case, we have a mostly day utilization and a night uh, utilization if we sum them per uh, day and night. So we first have them for all the nights separate in the data burst. And here we get a factor that's the, uh, I can show that maybe better first. Uh, a factor that's either day or night, true or false. And then I can sum them per day and night using the stack apply function, which is part of the raster package. And we could plot this, and now we would get the utilization per day and night. Uh, and again, let's take the square root to make the changes visible on the beamer. So here you see that during the night it's more active, it uses a larger space than during the day when it's mostly concentrated in a few spots. So this is all work that I've been doing mostly one and a half, two years ago. And meanwhile, we have been working with uh, Feda and Kami on the extension of this, where we don't look at the variances between uh, uh, changing over time, but also between directions. So we have a d variance in the next direction, so parallel, so from the previous location towards the next location, and one orthogonal to this. And um, we can show that this even performs better, especially if we have animals that have a very directed flight. In this case, it's an, a bat that flies here. And we see that the utilization density seems to be more realistic. The blue one is the bivariate Gaussian bridges, as we called it. And we see that the utilization is more narrow around the stretches of very directed flight. Um, so uh, Scott said I should hurry up. But this um, will calculate in the same way uh, as the Brownian bridge. It uses the function uh, dim BGB. 
and it functions mostly in the same way. Um, for those who want to try, please try. And if you want any help with it, come to me. And if you have any suggestions about either the, the calculation of the Brownian bridges or the move package, I would welcome them and see what we can do or help. Thank you. Yeah. Um, they're stored in there. At the moment, it's easiest to get the variance and look at the variance and see. And because this, you do this in a running window, the change point doesn't always fall exactly at the same location a bit. Um, so I think exploring the variance would be a first good step to see where the variance is high or where the variance is low. Sorry, the question was what to do in the if you could retrieve the change points. How, how problematic are missing data? How problematic missing data are? Um, in principle, the Brownian bridges work quite good with missing data because you're looking at uh, the diffusion rate over time. And if there is a longer time gap, it will account for this. Um, my experience is if the time gaps get very large, it gets more problematic. So the variance has to make several larger gaps. It just uses it as one point, but in principle, it works just as fine. Good. Thanks, Bart. <laughs>